In this talk, we'll focus on the role of portable chest x-rays in managing inpatients with respiratory distress. We'll review how chest x-rays complement other common diagnostic exams for inpatients with respiratory distress, what the capabilities and limitations of chest x-rays are in the inpatient setting, and we'll review some of the imaging features we're always looking for when inspecting an inpatient chest x-ray in this setting. Although the original intended audience for this talk was diagnostic radiology residents, I suspect anyone who takes care of inpatients may find something useful in this talk. Respiratory distress is a common situation that arises on the wards and requires prompt attention since patients can decompensate quickly. The basic strategy in this scenario is to establish a working diagnosis as promptly as possible and ensure that your patient's getting enough oxygen into their bloodstream while you're figuring things out. Sometimes supplemental oxygen administration will be required, which can be delivered by nasal cannula, face mask, or non-rebreather, depending on how much supplemental oxygen is needed. In patients who can't tolerate a nasal cannula or face mask, a face tent might be used. Once hypoxemia has been temporarily staved off, we've brought ourselves a little time to begin the diagnostic workup and establish a working diagnosis for the patient's respiratory distress, which will most often be one of eight most common causes, two airway issues, two pleural issues, two lung issues, and two other additional issues. Those issues are bronchospasm in a patient with asthma exacerbation or COPD, mucus plugging, pneumothorax, pleural fluid preventing lung expansion. While the pleural fluid may be an effusion, sometimes it could also be some other fluid like blood, for example. Pulmonary edema, pneumonia, PE, and hypoventilation. Hypoventilation probably um, most often in the setting of oversedation. This list is the primary differential diagnosis we'll typically work off of in an inpatient with respiratory distress, and it's the entire team's job, whether we're working on the wards or in the radiology reading room, to figure out which item on the list might be the culprit behind the patient's respiratory distress. Establishing a working diagnosis for inpatient respiratory distress requires a review of the patient's recent medical history and performing a focused physical exam, beginning with an assessment of the patient's vitals and general appearance. Uh, can the patient complete a sentence in a single breath? Do they appear cyanotic? Do they appear exhausted, confused, or non-responsive? Listening to the patient's lungs. While decreased breath sounds are a pretty non-specific finding, crackles on inspiration, which resemble the sound you hear when rolling your hair between your fingers next to your ear, can sometimes suggest pulmonary edema or pneumonia, while hearing a rub on inspiration or expiration, which sounds like treading on soft snow, may sometimes occur with pneumonia or PE. The presence of a wheeze, um, a high-pitched whistling sound, uh, on the other hand, can sometimes occur in the setting of bronchospasm. In addition to listening to the lungs, a focused physical exam of an inpatient with respiratory distress will also include listening to their heart for any abnormalities, looking for jugular venous distension in their neck, and checking for calf tenderness. Detecting a pronounced cardiac murmur or observing jugular venous distension in a patient with respiratory distress could open the door to a pulmonary edema diagnosis while eliciting um, calf tenderness or a positive Homan sign might lead towards a diagnosis of PE. After getting this preview from the focused physical exam, the diagnostic workup moves towards first-line diagnostic tests, which are usually the portable chest x-ray, EKG, and sometimes an ABG. Of these three tests, the most comprehensive is probably the portable chest x-ray and where diagnostic radiologists enter the picture. Although a portable chest x-ray is not an absolutely specific or sensitive test, it's a fast and important diagnostic tool that can often help substantially narrow down your differential diagnosis for respiratory distress in an inpatient. So let's dive into portable chest x-ray signs to look for in the setting of respiratory distress. Asthma exacerbation can be a cause for bronchospasm and may be precipitated by an upper respiratory tract infection, allergen exposure, or medical non-compliance. 
In many cases of asthma exacerbation, the chest x-ray ends up looking normal. However, if an abnormality is present on a chest x-ray in a patient with asthma exacerbation, it will usually be transient hyperinflation of the lungs, which will present as diaphragm flattening um, or lungs that appear blacker than normal. This may be apparent when comparing the current chest x-ray to a recent prior normal chest x-ray of the patient, or sometimes without a prior chest x-ray if the current changes are particularly pronounced. These two imaging features, diaphragm flattening, lungs that appear blacker than normal, are not highly specific or sensitive for asthma exacerbation, however, and can sometimes be observed in COPD and also in healthy young patients just taking a really deep breath. Bronchospasm can occur in patients with COPD, uh, which might be precipitated by a bacterial or viral respiratory tract infection, medical noncompliance, or continued smoking. The most common chest x-ray findings of COPD are chronic lung hyperinflation, demonstrated by the same lung hyperinflation imaging features we just um, mentioned in the setting of asthma exacerbation, and in more severe patients, um, diffusely attenuated peripheral lung vessels and lung vessel splaying caused by severe emphysematous regions or bully in a patient with severe emphysema. As we mentioned before, the imaging features of flattened diaphragms and hyperlucent lungs are not super sensitive or sp um, specific. Since folks with asthma exacerbations and healthy young patients taking a really deep breath can have these exact findings. Diffusely attenuated lung vessels and lung vessel splaying, however, features that occur in more severe emphysema are less likely to be seen in a healthy young patient just taking a deep breath and are more specific for emphysema. With mucus plugging in the central airways, abrupt cutoff of the bronchial air column might be visible on a chest x-ray, but tends to be challenging to pick up prospectively particularly on portable chest x-rays where imaging technique may not always be ideal. In fact, you're probably much more likely to pick up mucus plugging of a lobar bronchus uh, by recognizing the presence of obstructive lobar atelectasis caused by a lobar level mucus plug. Imaging features of right upper lobar, right lower lobar, and left lower lobar obstructive atelectasis are the easiest of the five to identify. You're looking for a homogeneous region of densely opacified lung with a sharp knife edge interface, like this case of right upper lobar atelectasis, this case of right lower lobar atelectasis, and this case of left lower lobar atelectasis. Obstructive left upper lobar atelectasis is a little trickier to pick up on a portable chest x-ray. The imaging features are an acute decrease in left lung volume and homogeneous apparent increased opacification of the entire lung, like on this image. Obstructive right middle lobar atelectasis is also sometimes trickier to pick up on a portable chest x-ray too, since it will be very tough to distinguish from just a right middle lobe consolidative pneumonia. We're usually pretty good at picking up pneumothoraces on portable chest x-rays, particularly ones large enough to cause a patient to be symptomatic. Imaging features are typically a sharp curvilinear interface with no lung markings in the region between the interface and the rib cage, and pronounced lucency of one side of the chest in the case of a large pneumothorax. In supine patients, the most non-dependent part of the rib cage may be the inferior anterior chest, not the lung apices, and result in slightly tougher cases, such as this one where the pneumothorax is mostly in the lower chest and not the apex. Finally, we always check for contralateral shift of the mediastinum and heart in pneumothorax cases, in case the pneumothorax is under tension and needs to be addressed emergently. Pleural fluid accumulations may be transudative effusions, exudative effusions, empyemas, or hemothoraces, and when large enough, can impair the lung's ability to remain expanded. Common imaging features of a pleural effusion on a portable chest x-ray include blunting of a lateral costophrenic angle, 
pleural fluid can present in other ways, though, um, in patients uh, who are supine. Uh, pleural fluid can lie between the lung apex and the upper rib cage, resulting in an apical pleural cap, or between the lateral margin of a lung and the rib cage, resulting in a lateral pleural band. Now, you don't want to be fooled by pleural fat, which can also present as a lateral pleural band. However, you can usually recognize pleural fat since it's typically bilaterally symmetric, chronic, and encountered in an obese patient. In a supine patient, a large pleural fluid accumulation can layer dependently along the posterior aspect of a hemithorax and result in a homogeneous gradient opacity on one side, like on the right side in this patient. Large layering pleural fluid accumulations are usually easier to recognize when unilateral. Because when they are bilateral, it becomes hard to differentiate bilateral layering pleural fluid from just low lung volumes or large body habitus. When calling a large unilateral layering pleural fluid accumulation, be sure to check that the patient isn't positioned obliquely on the image, since oblique patient positioning can create an appearance similar to a unilateral layering pleural effusion. In this patient, there appears to be a layering effusion on the left side, but it's actually just an artifact caused by the fact that the patient is obliquely positioned, which you can recognize due to the asymmetric appearance of both clavicles and the rib cage. When looking for pleural effusions on portable chest x-rays, be aware that our sensitivity can be limited. There's over a liter of pleural fluid in this patient's right chest, though the lateral costophrenic angle appears sharp. There's no lateral pleural band and there's no apical pleural cap. With pulmonary edema, you'll sometimes notice a bit of interreader and intrareader variability when the perceived pulmonary edema may be mild. That's partly because the subtle heterogeneous opacities that occur in the setting of interstitial pulmonary edema are sometimes tough to distinguish from the way lung looks when it's not completely inflated or when the x-ray exposure isn't ideal. There's more reader consistency with moderate pulmonary edema, however where the imaging finding is diffuse pulmonary vessel distension. Recognizing this does require you to have an internal mental picture of what normal is to compare to. If you read thousands of chest x-rays a year, you tend to have a good mental picture of normal. If you don't, try pulling up the patient's prior normal chest x-ray to compare to. With severe pulmonary edema, uh, severe pulmonary edema, uh, the finding we're looking for is traditionally diffuse bilateral lung consolidation that sometimes may spear the peripheral lungs. The peripheral lungs tend to be speared partly because the lymphatic drainage of the lungs tends to be most efficient peripherally. Be aware that severe pulmonary edema can sometimes present asymmetrically. For example, when it occurs in the context of asymmetric underlying emphysema or in a patient who happens to spend a lot of time in a decubitus position. So acute asymmetric or multifocal consolidation does not always mean lung infection. Also be aware that pulmonary edema can sometimes resolve asymmetrically too, resulting in a pattern that can mimic lung infection. In cases where you're on the fence, look at the last couple of chest x-rays and observe how the asymmetric consolidation has behaved day to day. Pneumonias tend to be um, relatively fixed in their look compared to asymmetric alveolar pulmonary edema whose appearance tends to shift, waxing and waning in different areas from x-ray to x-ray to x-ray. Also remember that the cardiac silhouette does not have to be enlarged for a diagnosis of pulmonary edema, whether it's cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic. New lung infection pneumonias will pick up on inpatient portable chest x-rays may present as a new focal or multifocal fluffy lung opacities. Our specificity for correctly calling lung infection pneumonia on a portable chest x-ray tends to be better in the upper lungs than in the lower lungs since subsegmental atelectasis, aspiration pneumonitis, um, which can also present as focal opacities and are leading competing differential diagnoses um, 
in the lower lungs. When a patient has a PE, most of the time their chest x-ray will appear unchanged from prior or normal, like in this patient. Perhaps you will see a very small pleural effusion, which is also a very nonspecific finding, prospectively speaking. However, occasionally if a PEE is large enough, perhaps you might notice a lung region where many of the pulmonary vessels appear newly attenuated compared to a prior chest x-ray, like in the upper left lung in this patient. However, this is a pretty subtle finding and pretty nonspecific, honestly, um, finding on portable chest x-rays. Um, that's most often caused by something else, like overpenetration uh, due to, you know, uh, technique um, or focal emphysema. If the P has caused a large enough pulmonary infarct, you might see a new focal peripheral lung opacity, but this too is a pretty nonspecific portable chest x-ray finding that's much more often caused by focal lung infection pneumonia or cancer. Hypoventilation, the final of our eight top suspects in an inpatient with respiratory stress is probably best established uh, at the bedside, though um, it might be suspected when lungs appear markedly hypoinflated on a portable chest x-ray. In addition to um, the patient's history, focused physical exam, and their portable chest x-ray, um, an AKG may sometimes provide um, some corroboration if the suspected cause of the inpatient's respiratory distress uh, might be cardiogenic or pulmonary thromboembolic. Um, sometimes an arterial blood gas might also be obtained, uh, which allows us to calculate an inpatient's arterial, um, sorry, uh, an inpatient's alveolar arterial oxygen gradient. An elevated AA gradient indicates that some sort of oxygen transfer gas exchange problem is present or might be present. Um, AA gradients are often normal in the setting of hypoventilation, but may be abnormally elevated in any of the other seven top causes of respiratory distress. Once the portable chest x-ray and other first-line diagnostic studies are back, a working diagnosis can often be established and addressed. For example, management of suspected bronchospasm in the setting of acute asthma exacerbation uh, is usually medical and may involve nebulizers, sub-Q amphidephrine, IV solumedrol, or amylophilin. Uh, management of suspected bronchospasm in a setting of COPD might involve oxygen and chest PT to clear airway secretions in addition to nebulizers steroids or sometimes antibiotics. Um, aggressive interventions might include BiPAP um, or mechanical ventilation uh, for which absolute and relative criteria exist. Options to clear suspected central mucus plugging might range from nebulizer treatments, suctioning, pulmonary toilet, and chest PT to bronchoscopy. Pneumothoraces that are symptomatic are often managed by decompression with a thoracostomy tube placed at the bedside by surgery or a small bore pleural drain inserted by interventional radiology. Pleural fluid accumulations that are large enough to cause respiratory distress are usually drained. How the drainage is approached may depend on the size of the accumulation and whether it's loculated or not. Large Non-loculated pleural fluid accumulations can often be drained at the bedside with or without ultrasound imaging to find an optimal needle insertion site. Loculated pleural effusions may be more likely to be drained by a service like interventional radiology where placement of the needle or drain may need to occur under direct imaging guidance. Treatments for suspected pulmonary edema will depend on the root cause of the pulmonary edema though sitting the patient up, nitrates and diuretics are interventions folks might first try. Management of suspected lung infection pneumonia depends on whether the pathogen may be viral, bacterial, or fungal. Suspected bacterial pneumonias may be managed initially empirically, and different antibiotic classes may be favored for different scenarios. If the initial workup points towards PE, as a possible explanation for respiratory distress, a confirmatory test uh, is probably required. In the modern era, 
that test for all intents and purposes is a PE protocol enhanced chest CT. Management options for PE um, typically involve systemic anticoagulation or a venal cable filter if anticoagulation is contraindicated. In severe cases, much more aggressive interventions, uh, interventions such as um, thrombolysis or embolectomy are occasionally considered. Hopefully the patient's respiratory stress subsides with treatment. If not, the diagnostic workup, establishment of a working diagnosis or management or treatment strategy are revisited and another iteration of this process begins.